What's up? This is uh, Anthony Davis, and I'm going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about um, headstands and shoulder stands, um, and the anatomy and safety, as well as the benefits, um, possible benefits of shoulder stand, and uh, ultimately come to maybe some conclusions about uh, weighing the risk and reward and what you're trying to get. Um, what you're trying to get out of it and see if that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to actually hold on for a moment and see if anybody's going to uh, join us here live um, before, before I launch into some of the um, more detailed anatomy or anything like that. Um, so I will, uh, hold on. Okay. So I'm just going to give it a second here and see if, uh, see if people are going to join here. Come join me. We're talking about anatomy. Come join us. Learn about the spine. All right. Yeah, what up, Katie? Peace. All right. Okay. Um, so let's get into some anatomy about uh, shoulder stand, head stand. Um, the, when I'm addressing any pose, um, in yoga, I take a very utilitarian approach. Um, what I mean by that is I'll weigh, what are we trying to get out of it? What is the potential benefit? Um, and then what are the risks associated with doing that? And yeah, yeah, this is my first Instagram live. So this is fun. I tried Facebook live, uh, last night and that was, that was actually a success. So, um, this is interesting. I guess, uh, Instagram doesn't let you like, it doesn't automatically post this after. So I don't know. It might vanish into the ether. We'll see. Um, but yeah, so basically, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about any pose, we, um, anatomically speaking, like what are you trying to get out of it? And um, what could possibly go wrong? And m my personal philosophy is uh, really straightforward, and I would hope this is kind of the approach of, of any um, uh, yoga teacher. If the risks outweigh the rewards, then I don't teach it, you know? And so unfortunately, the short, short answer to, to these poses in my personal um, approach to teaching and practicing yoga is I don't, I don't think that the risks associated with shoulder stand and headstand um, are you, you know worth flirting with um, the potential rewards. I don't see any rewards that you could get from headstand or shoulder stand uh, that you couldn't get from other safer poses, right? Um, so I would say, uh, but before I get into the anatomy, and I wanna, I'll explain exactly what's happening in the, in the body and the spine and all that stuff. But feel free if I'm like, I'm genuinely curious, post, like, I think you can, you know, you, I see you commenting. Um, I, if you, if you have a reason to do it, tell me why you would do shoulder stand and tell me why you would do headstand. So that's the first and most important thing. If you're looking at shoulder stand and you're looking at headstand, why do you want to do them? So like, tell me what your reasoning is. Um, what benefit are you going to get out of it? Because if you don't even have a potential benefit, then I don't see any reason to do the poses. But if you have some really great benefit from doing the poses, then it's uh, a conversation worth having. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, if, uh, if I see those pop up on the comments, I'll, I'll address it. But um, let's talk about the anatomy. <clears throat> so let's do um, headstand first because headstand 
um, comes, if I'm not mistaken, headstand comes before shoulder stand in most uh, traditional, in Ashtanga and Iyengar. I think uh, headstand always comes first. So headstand, <clears throat> it, what happens is you're doing something called axial um, loading. So when you, uh, there are, are a lot of different ways that we can handle a force, and one of them is axial loading. So a pressure is exerted on the top of the head and it presses straight down through the spine. And what happens is that this um, force, okay, so you got your spine, and if we're in um, headstand and we have axial loading and we have a force exerted down um, from the top of the head, it's distributed through the spine, right? And when you look at the spine, one thing I want to point out is that the, um, the actual vertebral bodies of the cervical spine are, well, it's actually hard to see from that aspect. If you look from the front, the vertebral body, which is this portion right here, this portion, which is the mostly the weight boring, bearing portion, is much smaller in the cervical spine, period, right? And then these get really, really hefty down here in the lumbar spine. So if you think about how we walk around normally in our lives, um, all of the weight from our head and all the weight of our arms and when we're carrying things, bags and stuff like that, all of these, um, all of this weight goes down into the lumbar spine and it's bigger and the bodies are bigger and the facet joints, the joints here are bigger and more robust and, and they can handle that weight better. So if we flip the body upside down, and we put weight on the top of the head, then you're more likely to have um, all of the potential risks associated with compression. So what happens in our bodies due to compression is unavoidable. Um, there's kind of a trade-off in our lives. Like in order to nourish our joints, we need to move and we need to use them. But there's trade-off. Every time we move our joints, those joints wear down. And that's just part of being a human being is that over time, your joints and discs are going, going to wear out. That's actually why one of the reasons why old people are shorter than they were when they were younger is literally the discs. So here's a, here are a bunch of discs, right? So if you have two vertebral segments here, um, I grabbed two random ones, so these don't actually match. But if you have two um, vertebra right here in between, you've got a disc, hold on, which is just, you know, one of these. So, and they will, I'll just go ahead and pull one of these out. So the disc is gonna go right in here in between the two uh, vertebra bodies, right? And the more you squish the disc, the more that disc is going to get really skinny and skinny over time and it's just going to wear down and that's okay like that's just part of being alive um, the other thing that happens is that the the joints here let's see if you can see okay so right here is a facet joint and i don't have um the these vertebral uh these vertebra are not aligned properly but just imagine this is a joint and the more that I squish that, the more it's going to wear down. So it's inevitable. It's going to happen as long as you're alive. But those areas are the, um, the main areas that are going to suffer due to compression. So basically what happens is you wear down the cartilage. Um, so these discs, these are made of cartilage with a little jelly donut inside, basically. And uh, the facet joints are coated in a slippery coating. And so those wear down over time as well. Um, so basically if you're putting weight on the top of your head in headstand, then you will be adding to compressive forces in the spine. Okay. I'll, I'll say it again. If you're putting weight in the top of your head, you will be, um, suffering from any uh, of, of the associated compressive forces, compressive being squishing from the top down, um, into your spine. And there is 
there's no way that you can avoid that. Okay, I'll say that again. There are no there are no muscles in your neck, in your in your chest, in your back. There are no muscles that can help you to uh, prevent a load going down. You can't actually lift. We talk in yoga about lifting through the crown of our head. We want to become long through the spine, but we actually cannot resist an axial load. Okay, so it's, it's kind of unfortunate that way. So you can't push into the ground with the top of your head. You can't do that. It doesn't do anything. You're still um, bearing the axial load. You can get your spine into a really nice alignment while you're doing it so that you, you have less, because if, if your spine were like tilted forward and then you squished it, then the disc would go and get pushed back, you see? So if your spine is in poor alignment, then you can really screw things up. But if your spine is nicely aligned, then it's going to be evenly distributed through the whole surface of the um, vertebral body, right? So um, the best you can do, again, I'll just say this, if, you, if you're pushing down through the top of the head, the very best you can do is to have good alignment in your spine. Um, but otherwise you're, you're gonna have compressive forces. So I think that, and if your reason, you know, I think that, sh oh, so shoulder stand feels great when my neck is sore. Ooh, huh, I wonder why that is. Um, yeah, one of the things that happens with us yogis is we get kind of addicted to stretching. So if we are, yeah, um, oftentimes just by creating movement in the area, we kind of alleviate some symptoms temporarily. But if we're, if our go-to move for alleviating pain is to stretch the area, in the National Academy of Sports Medicine guide for corrective stretching exercises, um, they recommend that if you have pain in an area, you do not stretch the muscle. So if, if, if there's something sore and you go and you stretch it out, if the back of your neck is sore and you go to shoulder stand and you stretch that out, that would be contraindicated according to the Na uh, NASM, National Academy of Sports Medicine. Um, so there are things that you can do to alleviate the compressive forces. So you, you know, when you're here in um, headstand real quick, you can push, you can push into the elbows. So really you don't have any weight on the top of your head, you can move your head. Um, but the problem is that like, yeah, most, you know, if you're, if you're pretty advanced, um, and you've been practicing for a while, then you can, you can do that. You can, you can resist, you can lift up through the shoulders and up through the elbows, and you can make sure there's no weight on your head. But I mean, have zero weight, don't have any weight in your head, none at all. And then I, I wonder why not just do forearm stand? You know, why not just do forearm stand or a handstand or dolphin or something like that? Um, I just don't see the reason to do headstand. Um, and the bigger issue is when you're teaching this to people who don't already have that strength, the upper body strength to hold themselves with their head, you know, off the ground, um, that they're, they're gonna catch themselves with their head. And that's, uh, I think that's, you know, the risk in that case is higher, you know? So I, I don't like, I don't like that. Um, it's not that it can't be done properly and safely, it's just uh, that in order to do that, you have to have zero. I mean, I, I think that you have zero weight in the head. I don't think there's a good reason to put weight on the top of your head, you know? And um, I've seen, and I'm fully aware that a lot of cultures carry bricks on their head, and people make the argument that over time you can build up the strength of your neck. That's not how your bones work. That's not how your cartilage works. Your cartilage and your bone, well, your bones will adapt it is true that your bones, uh, the bone density will, will become stronger over time. However, that doesn't prevent injury because the cartilage is still wearing down and you still have the risk of, um, of slipping uh, a disc, right? So bone density might increase, but you still have these other risks associated with like carrying something on the top of your head. So that's my main, my main complaint about um, headstand. Again, if you're gonna teach it, the biggest thing here is that you are lifting you're, you're lifting up here. So you have no weight on the top of your head. Now, shoulder stand, um, I 
I think we already spend so much time with our necks in flexion like this. Um, so if we're doing shoulder stand, our neck is in really extreme flexion, right? And then we put weight on it. So we spend so much time doing this anyway. We're texting like this, we're typing like this, um, we're reading books like this, we cook like this, we do, we do everything with our neck like this, right? So I don't think it's a very useful practice to, to, to put your neck like this and then put weight on it, right? By flipping yourself upside down. So, um, however, the, the kind of mental aspect and, and being able to uh, feel kind of calm and everything after doing a shoulder stand, th that's real, you know? And, and you can help to calm your nervous system down and, and you can just change things up with the circulation. So if you've been sitting all day and your muscles in your legs haven't been helping to pump the blood back to your heart, um, then getting your legs up is a great thing to do. So how can we do that? I mean, legs up the wall, you know, you just put your, your hips on a bolster and get them up the wall, or you just uh, do it in the middle of the room. You get your hips up on a bolster and get them up like that. And then you don't put as much cervical flexion into the story, but I'll give you an option. Uh, another option is if you really want it to look and feel more like shoulder stand, then you get really big, um, I don't have any bolsters here, so I'm just gonna use pillows to show you this. Um, but imagine, and I'm gonna prop this way up here. So if I've got Fred here, right? So if I take Fred and I drape the, uh, the neck over um, a bolster and then, uh, and Fred would be using his hands to support his hips. So if you do this and then get the legs up for shoulder stand, um, then you don't have a huge kink in the neck, right? Your weight is actually on your shoulders um, under here right? The weight is here on the bolster. And then uh, with the legs way up in the air, you still get the reverse uh, blood flow so that you, you know, get your legs up, you get to feel calm and all that. But you get to do this without essentially like, you know, fucking up your neck. So um, the, the point here is that you don't, I mean, God damn, if we're spending this much time with our neck in this, we don't want to put more pressure on it. And I'll point this out again here. So if our vertebra are shaped like this, and in between each segment, there's this little jelly donut. And if we're in flexion, it looks like this, okay? So we're kind of gapping the back area. And if you squeeze, um, that means that you're putting a lot of force on the front. So if I push down here, then what's happening to that jelly donut is it slips backwards, right? And that is a bulged or herniated disc. Um, that's the potential risk there. The other risk, again, is that the facet joints, where the two um, on the back side of the spine, here, so there's a joint right there, and this joint also will begin to gap, and you're starting to pull on the ligaments that actually hold that joint together. And if you start to stretch out your ligaments, your ligaments are like a plastic bag, and if you start to stretch your ligaments, they don't ever come back to the same resting length. It's not like muscles. Again, muscles, if you stretch them, they, they'll come back to their resting length. Ligaments are like a plastic bag. So if I stretch this plastic bag, I stretch it out, I can never get that to return to its resting length. I'm always gonna have this little you know, kink here. It's always gonna be loose. You, you never have a rebound for your ligaments. So the more we stretch out those ligaments, um, the worse off we are. So if you're gonna do shoulder stand or anything like that, just really use a lot of props and get that, um, that heart up so you're not putting weight on the neck and you're not in really extreme flexion. Um, that's the biggest thing. A lot of people think that your thyroid gland, that if you, if you tuck your chin and you squeeze into the thyroid gland, um, like you're giving your thyroid gland and parathyroid uh, gland a massage, and you're upside down in shoulder stand. So you're upside down, you get the weight from your legs um, and all the blood rushing to your thyroid gland, 
they think that this is going to make your thyroid gland function better. And your thyroid gland is really important for all kinds of different functions and immunity and um, autonomic responses and all that stuff. That's not true. That's not how glands work. You can't just s squeeze them and make them work better. Um, your, your body has a lot of really complicated like signaling chains. You know, one thing, it's like telephone, they have to kind of one thing has to talk to another thing and then that thing talks to the next thing and then that thing talks to this thing and then finally you actually get the result. So you can't just squeeze a gland and make it work better. Um, so those are some of the alleged benefits of shoulder stand. Um, just to, to sum it up though, I do like the, the feeling of being upside down and I do like the down regulation of the nervous system, being able to calm your body, your mind down and you can do that with other safer poses, right? I'm not saying it's impossible to do shoulder stand and headstand in a safe way, but you do have to be um, sort of modifying the classical versions to do it safely. So if you're gonna do those poses, modify them really uh, to a safe extent, or just do different poses, right? Do legs up the wall if you wanna get your feet up. Um, and for headstand, you know, just do a forearm stand instead so you don't put weight on the head. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's about that on, on headstand and shoulder stand. Um, again, if you, for some reason, you practice these yoga poses and you, like, a lot of people, see, the, the problem is a lot of people associate these poses with some kind of really, really, like, esoteric spiritual experience. Like, oh my God, I, you know, I practice headstand and I see fucking aliens you know <laughs> like if you have some kind of religious experience every time you practice headstand then you just you know you've got to weigh the pros and the cons against that and if that experience for you is worth the potential risk to your spine then that's your choice you know but you should know what's going on in your spine and uh the one last thing um i'll answer your question in just a second katie um, the one last thing that I will point out too here is it's not just, it's not just about the discs. It's much more important than that. <clears throat> okay. So in here, in the neck, I just don't like any poses that screw with your neck. You know, that's, that's my personal take. I just don't, I don't, I just don't like that. So all these little yellow guys, um, yeah, I'll totally post a, a supported version. That's a good point. Um, so in here, all, the red is your vertebral artery. Okay, so this supplies, you know, blood to the brain. You know, if you sever that, you're dead. You would be dead, right? If you sever this, you'll have a stroke. Um, and all these little yellow guys are your nerves. And these nerves control things like your, um, you know, being able to swallow, uh, your tongue, um, muscles in the face and the neck. These, uh, these nerves will control your arms. These nerves will control uh, your internal organs. These nerves are really important for basically your whole body, you know, to be a living human being. If you fuck with these nerves, it's really bad news. Um, and the more compressive forces, and you can see that there's kind of a tight space. There's really not a lot of space in there. So if you start screwing with the space in between each vert uh, vertebral segment, then it's not that you can't do that, right? I mean, we can move, you know, we can, oh, this skeleton's not with. So, I mean, we can, you know, move around and it's okay to an extent, but if we start to, you know, really put a lot of force there, just the risk starts to, to really hike up. And if you, again, if, we, if you screw with any of these vessels or um, uh, nerves, the consequences would be really bad. Um, it would be hard to really, really fuck them up. More likely what's going to happen is you're just going to have some kind of like a little pinching and a nerve over years and years of practicing and kind of loose ligaments and that kind of stuff. Um, what do you think about the Iyengar version of shoulder stand with the legs on a chair? <clears throat> so there, I've seen different versions like that. So the one I like to do is I'll put my hips on a chair. So I put my hips up on a chair, and then my shoulders are actually resting on a bolster underneath the chair, and then my head is touching the ground just kind of barely. That version is my favorite. Um, yeah.
because then your your hips are supported you don't even have to hold your body up so there's really no there's not a lot of effort to it you're not using your ab abdominal strength to keep keep your legs up in the air and all that stuff so that's my favorite version again hips on a chair and then your your um, then your shoulders on a bolster and then your head dangles off of that so your your body is actually more like this you know or it's more like um, yeah, I can't really demonstrate it without sh actually sh posting a picture, but yeah, so legs straight up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, okay, I'll post, I'll, I'll try and find a chair. <laughs> I just realized I don't actually have a chair in my, <laughs> my house. All I have is floor cushions. <laughs> All right, so get, first step, get a chair. Second step, post a photo. <laughs> All right, so I can do that. Um, but other than that, I mean, I don't know, do you have any other re reason to do those poses? Because, I mean, uh, I know it's classical, but, you know, you know me, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of tradition, so. The other part of that uh, traditional aspect is is like cleansing your nadis, you know, the um, energy channels in your body. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that works. I don't know. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Well, if maybe you're, I don't know if you're typing, but. Um, if I see something here in a second, then I'll uh, answer it. Otherwise, I'll uh, cut this video off here in just a second, and um, and I'll post a photo on the the headstand and or on the the shoulder stand. Headstand is tough. People are like so married to it, and Iyengar recommended doing headstand, you know, for fifteen to twenty minutes. Fifteen to twenty minutes on your head. I mean, seriously, tell me that you, you you're not going to put up some weight. On your head by the end of that 15 or 20 minutes you know you might start off for one or two minutes and really have a lot of good strength in your arms and you really might be able to hold yourself upright without damaging your neck but man after 15 or 20 minutes you know come on you're supporting your weight with your head um, at least I'm gonna throw out a random number 20% of your weight maybe probably more than that probably more like 50% of your weight is on your um, head so that would be a serious problem. I just feel keep doing headstand just because you know <laughs> I wonder if it's okay to do. <laughs> yeah. Do any other poses feel like shoulder stand? Can you do do you do any other poses um, that make you feel good in the way that shoulder stand makes you feel? You know, do you have alternatives to shoulder stand? I'll let you, uh, I'll let you answer that, but headstands, I just don't like headstands. I just think, I, I especially don't like them uh, to teach in, in classes because the chances of somebody who's new to it, the chances of them um, catching their balance using their head Right? They kind of like, they, they kind of get it with their shoulders and then they got to catch their balance with their head. Man, you do not want to be stabilizing your entire body weight using your head. You don't want to stabilize your whole body weight using the muscles in your neck and your head. You know, the potential for something there is, um, I don't think it's worth it, personally. Plus, man, just get an inversion table. Oh, the other thing you can do instead of headstand is I, I don't have enough blocks. I only have two blocks here. Um, but if I had four blocks, you can take four blocks, put them on the ground, um, so stack up the blocks really high. And then if you had um, a bunch of blocks, so just imagine that these are um, blocks and they're stacked really high, like four blocks high or three blocks high. Then, and I put this against the wall, it doesn't have to be against the wall, but it's nice when it's against the wall because you can relax. Then you put your head down in between the blocks, right? And so your shoulders rest on the blocks, 
right? So your head is down and you put your shoulders on the blocks and then you get your legs up in the air, right? And then you're supported. That's a, that's a really nice way to do headstand. And then you don't have any, you have zero weight on the head. Zero weight on the head. So that's a really good way to do it. But if you're doing that, don't let the, um, don't let the blocks pull your shoulders down. You need to resist the blocks a little bit. Make sense? Um, uh, and the reason for that, by the way, if you, if you have blocks, so again, if you have two blocks here and you put your head down in between the blocks, so you have zero weight on the head and you put your shoulders down and then you're up here, right? Then um, what happens uh, if, you, if you let the blocks pull down, you might be stretching out your brachial plexus, um, which is like a bundle of nerves that um, goes into the arm and you don't want to stretch that out. It's like wearing a really heavy backpack. You actually need to kind of lift your shoulders up. So if you're doing that and you have the blocks here, you got to resist the blocks a little bit, but that's the only effort you need. And then you have no weight on the head, your neck is okay and all of that. So that's really good. Um, what do you, uh, so I would imagine plow. <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, yes, plow is, now you can do plow in a different way where it's not exactly plow. Um, so instead of getting your, let's see if you can see me. Yeah, you can. Okay, so instead of, um, I can't look this way and do this because that would be dangerous for my, for my neck. But instead of um, getting up onto the shoulders here, right, and then taking the, the feet back, what I want to do is um, I actually want to keep most of my back on the ground, right? So I keep most of my back on the ground and I basically just do a forward fold, right? So I keep my head down, keep most of my back on the ground, and then just kind of go back. So I could do it like that. Um, so it's really more like Paschimo Tanasana. It's more like a forward fold because you don't, you don't end up, your back, instead of looking like this, looks like a gentle curve, right? Through the whole spine. So it's more like Paschimo Tanasana. So you can do that instead of um, plow. Yeah. Uh, and, and remember, my philosophy when you're stretching muscles in general, um, and this, the, the science on it is basically this. If you're not using your muscles while you're stretching, then you're stretching ligaments and tendons and fascia, connective tissue. Some people think that that's a good idea. I, I don't agree with that um, because your ligaments don't get, uh, they don't rebound, they don't, they don't come back uh, to, uh, you need tension in the body. You need tension to hold your joints together. So if you stretch out your ligaments, then you'll never ever rebound. It's like this plastic bag. Again, if you stretch the plastic bag, it never comes back to its resting length. That's what your ligaments are like. So I don't, the other reason I don't like plow is not just the pressure on the neck, but it's a passive, it's a passive stretch. It's a totally passive stretch, really, you know? Um, you're upside down and you stretch the entire back side of your body from the base of your skull down, you know, down the base of your spine and then all the way into your legs and, and the whole, everything is stretched out and, and you're not using any muscular engagement to do that. So you're stretching ligaments. And in principle, I don't think that that's useful. I don't see any benefit that comes from that physiologically. However, if you do that and you just kind of feel good, that's, I mean, that's okay. That's valid. Like that's your experience and that's okay. But you need to know that it's not the, it's not effective for your muscles. It's not effective for your ligaments and your connective tissues. Right. And I posted recently, um, something that I, I think a lot of people resonated with, but some people got really irrit irritated with, which was essentially calling, um, calling out Iyengar <laughs> for basically, you know, a bit, being a cult um, because people do the poses in the name of spirituality and they hurt themselves and if you're hurting yourself because it's a tradition if you're hurting yourself because you know well my teacher said to do it and that teacher said to do it and it's in some really old book well I saw it in a really old book so it's got to be good that's not a good reason to do it right 
Um, so we know we have real science that's talking about your ligaments and joints and your muscles and how to stretch and and how to c use corrective stretching protocols in a safe way. And um, we just in yoga in general, in general in yoga, we stretch wrong, which is weird because we're the we're like the stretching experts, you know, and we are really good at making people into Gumby, um, but that's not functional. It's not, um, uh, it, it doesn't have good results long term if you just become extremely flexible. And, you know, because again, your, your body needs to be tense. Some, some part, it, it needs a balance of tension and mobility. So, yeah, cool. Any other questions on uh, shoulder stand, headstand, mobility, hypermobility? Um, the Ashtanga or Iyengar cult? No, <laughs> I jest, I jest. I actually really like what Iyengar um, studios do now because they're really all about props and they're really all about um, helping people to um, n not force any kind of pose. So that's good. I appreciate the direction they've gone, but their origins, I, I think, were really like circus tricks, a lot of circus tricks. Um, and it's still really pl prevalent. Um, I'll wait just a second in case anybody's typing a question, but I'm going to peace out in a second. Any other questions? Anything? All right. Cool. Um, yeah. So in short, if you're practicing headstand, shoulder stand, have a good reason. If you're looking at any other yoga pose, have a good reason to do it. If you don't have a really good, solid reason to do it, then choose something else. Choose something you know for sure is safe, right? But if it makes you feel amazing, then you gotta know uh, the risk versus reward. Yeah? Cool. All right. Peace.